Good morning, everybody. Morning, and welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Lars Corsa Wortmann. I'm the division head for pediatric cardiology, and uh, today is uh, Kasdan Day. For us in cardiology, Kasdan Day is a day of learning, of exchange, of exploration. And the reason we're having Kasdan Day, or the opportunity to have Kasdan Day, is because of the generous donation by the Kasdan uh, family. They had a child um, who was born with uh, significant congenital heart disease and unfortunately passed away from it uh, more than 50 years ago uh, outside of Oregon. But the grandparents resided in Portland and they made this generous donation. And uh, for the 50 years that followed, um, this has really been a who is who in congenital cardiac care, as you see from the list uh, that I've put up there. Now, few of those luminaries have made the continued significant impact in various fields uh, uh, in our uh, pediatric cardiology world to be invited back a second time to Kasdan. And today's speaker uh, is one of those few exceptions. Uh, we had him out here in uh, 2014 to educate us about fetal cardiology. And today he's going to talk about uh, something entirely different. Before I hand it over to Dr. Maggie Likes to introduce our speaker today, I do want to extend a very warm welcome to um, everybody who joined us today um, online or in the room, but especially uh, to our former fellows and faculty, to our emeritus faculty, to our partners in Bend, and to our friends from PCCO across the river here in Portland. So welcome and thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, so uh, we are going to have grand rounds right now. And at 12 noon, there will be a smaller event uh, where it's going to be case-based learning uh, uh, directed by uh, Kara and the fellows. And then today at 4 o'clock, I invite you all back to come here for Knight Cardiovascular Institute grand rounds once again with our speaker today. So with that, and without further ado, I hand it off to Maggie to introduce our speaker. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, as Laura said, I'm Maggie Likes. I'm the pediatric cardiologist down south, so you have a face to me now. Um, it is my honor to introduce our speaker today. Um, and I need to forward slides, maybe. How do I do this? There we go. We'll get to that later. OK. So our speaker today, Dr. Jack Rychek, is the Robert and Dolores Harrington Endowed Chair um, in Pediatric Cardiology, the Associate Chief of Cardiology, and Director of the Fetal Heart Program at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He's a pediatric cardiologist with interests in complex cardiovascular conditions, in particular our kiddos with single ventricle heart disease. He also has a special interest in the long-term outcomes of these patients and is the founding lead of the Fontan Rehabilitation, Wellness, and Resilience Development, or the Fontan Forward Program. This is a multidisciplinary clinic that's focused on the care of patients with Fontan circulation and their families. He's a member of the executive leadership team of the Fontan Outcomes Network. This is a national multi-center registry and learning network. Dr. Rychek has lectured around the world and authored over 300 peer-reviewed manuscripts, review articles, and editorials, including one of our popular fetal textbooks. He also is the lead author on the, of the American Heart Association scientific statement paper on the evaluation and management of the child and adult with Fontan circulation. He's an avid teacher. He has coordinated numerous medical conferences that I have been lucky enough to attend and really have enjoyed listening to him speak. And I really cannot wait to hear this lecture today on life with half a heart, surviving and thriving with a Fontan circulation. So please, everyone, let's welcome Dr. Jack Reichert. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> thank, thank you, uh, Lars, Maggie, uh, and all of you today for this, uh, this uh, fantastic opportunity. It is uh, my, my second time uh, here at uh, Dornbecker OHSU, uh, and thank you to the Kasdan family uh, 
uh, for providing us with, uh, with this opportunity to uh, exchange information and share knowledge uh, with each other. Um, also great to, uh, to see some old friends, uh, Dr. Victor Menashe, uh and uh, others who are here who I've had the opportunity to, uh, to engage with over the years and looking forward to chatting and making some new friends today as well. Um, the last time I was here, uh, I talked about um, my uh, experiences with fetal life. And here I am, nine years later, talking to uh, not about a, a newfound uh, love or passion. This existed back then as well. But uh, it is, uh, I think, a natural uh, offshoot from my interest in the fetal realm. And that is in trying to do the best that we can for our most complex patients with congenital heart disease. And for any of you who you know, touch the realm of, of congenital heart care, it's our patients who are born with single ventricle. If you think about all the things that we manage today, um, total anomalous pulmonary venous connection, uh, or transposition of the great arteries, or uh, tetralogy of Fallot, we have strategies that get us pretty close to normal not perfectly normal, far from it in some circumstances, but pretty close. We still cannot do that for single ventricle. We have a pathway of survival, but as you'll hear, um, it's fraught with uh, challenges and uh, still many, many solutions that we need to find to be able to create a normal quality and duration of life for these particular individuals. So this is a pediatric grand rounds. Um, we're going to start with some basics. And I apologize for the folks who may obviously know a little bit about this, but the heart has four chambers. <laughs> the heart has four chambers. It's supposed to have four chambers. Uh, a quick anecdote. I hope it doesn't take me over time. I was traveling back from, uh, from China a couple of years ago, and I was not dressed appropriately. I hadn't shaven, and I kind of looked disheveled, and it was period of time where we had to wait in line to get back into the U.S. And so I'm standing in line and somebody pulls me out and looks at me and says, you know, starts questioning me. Where were you? What do you do? I go, well, I was in China. I was lecturing. Lecturing on what? I go, I'm a cardiologist. The guy looks at me. He says, a cardiologist? How many chambers does the heart have? <laughs> and I'm in my, you know, sleepless state looking at this guy going, is he for real? <laughs> so I said, three. <laughs> <laughs> Most of my patients have three, and I sort of explained, so he backed away. But yeah, you're supposed to have four. But single ventricle is defined as a condition in which, for one reason or another, there's only one pumping chamber that is well developed, and the other, either assigned to delivering blood flow to the body or to the lungs, is not functioning the way that it should. And we split hairs and spend you know, hours talking about anatomical characterization and such. But in essence, I think for purposes of this, of this um, discussion, you're supposed to have two pumps. And if you only have one, whether it's a right or a left, that's a big problem. How big of a problem is that? And this is from uh, the Hoffman-Kaplan data, which I think is still probably the best uh, information we have. It gives us a sense of the incidence of congenital heart disease. So these are numbers per million live births. And if you look at transposition, tetralogy, single ventricle, VSD, and all forms of congenital heart disease, in a conservative way, single ventricle, you know, I, I added up tricuspid atresia patients, the HLHS patients, and some others in that uh, particular paper, and it's a little bit under 600 per million live births. In the United States today, that number is declining, but there are about mm, close to 4 million live births per year. So that gives us, again conservatively, approximately 2,000 children born every year with single ventricle type congenital heart disease in the United States. That's equivalent to the new number of childhood leukemia cases, interestingly. Uh, it's Christmas time, so you can't avoid seeing all the uh, St. Jude's commercials on TV and such for leukemia and all of that. We don't have a commercial for congenital heart disease, even though the numbers are, are probably the same and for all forms of congenital heart disease, higher than it is for leukemia. And based on the strategy of care that's been developed over the last 50 years, we have a growing world population. 
of individuals who've never walked the face of the earth before with single ventricle congenital heart disease. Estimated today uh, from some estimates from my good friend Yves Dudekum, who's now at DC Children's and had been in Australia for a while, about 60 to 80,000 people alive today uh, with single ventricle type congenital heart disease. How have we created this, this success? It's through the following surgical strategy for about the last 30 years or so. You're born with this birth defect of having only one pumping chamber, and you need to know about the outflow tracts. Either you've got limited pulmonary blood flow, limited systemic blood flow, or unobstructed flow, and then there's a strategy of care for each of those that creates a balanced circulation in the newborn period. That's the initial goal. So if you have limited pulmonary blood flow, a shunt, or stenting the ductus arteriosus. If you have limited systemic blood flow, a stage one Norwood is undertaken for those with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Unobstructed blood flow, you might get a pulmonary artery band. That, again, achieves the objective of creating balanced blood flow in the newborn period, because ultimately, the solution here, and I go through this, and each time I explain it to a family, it's, it's kind of almost a, a wonder that you don't need a pump to push blood into the lungs if conditions are appropriate. If the lungs have developed appropriately, you can create a pathway and connect the veins that drain blood flow from the body directly to the lungs. Not all at once. First, in a single operation called a bidirectional glen or superior vena cava pulmonary, uh, cava pulmonary connection, at about four to six months of age, the lungs have matured enough to accept that connection. And then ultimately, at about two to four years of age, routing the lower venous flow into that connection, something called the Fontan operation. A little bit of animation. Uh, again, we use this to, to help educate our, our families about what we're, what we're talking about. If you have hypoplastic left heart syndrome, this is how we approach creating that balanced flow. Uh, by doing something called a Norwood operation and either placing a shunt to allow for pulmonary blood flow or currently today placing a conduit from the right ventricle to the pulmonary arteries. Again, creating that balance of flow that sustains the single ventricle state until you get to about four to six months of age where the following is then undertaken, where the superior vena cava is connected directly to the pulmonary artery. That channels blue blood into the lungs in a secure manner. Pink blood goes back to the, your single ventricle that, that is then ejected out uh, into the body. And then at two to four years of age, a return visit, and now the inferior vena cava in a number of different ways, either through an extra cardiac conduit, as you see here, is connected to the branch pulmonary arteries or um, a tunnel can be created through the heart, through the atrium itself, that then channels that inferior vena cable flow. And this is the sustained state that you're left with, the Fontan circulation, where you may or may not have a fenestration, a small opening, some centers do that. But in essence, blood flows to the lungs without a pump. And that is sustainable for years, for decades. Um, and your single ventricle that nature has given you, right or left, delivers the blood to the body. It's not a cure. It's not a complete solution. And it is fraught with errors, challenges, complications, systemic complications. And that's what we're going to talk about, yeah, what some of those complications are. Before we even get to that, uh, a bit of a sense of how uh, patients currently do from my other passion, other area of interest, and that's prenatal life. So I was asked this once by a, um, by, by a family. Okay, you know, uh, talking about statistics, you know, there's X percent, every center has their X percent survival of a Norwood operation, here's your interstage mortality, here's your Glenn mortality, here's your Fontan mortality, and you kind of do the math and you maybe figure out what the outcomes are. But I was asked this by, by a mother, a uh, student uh, woman who said, Okay, tell me, as we sit here now, with my 20-week fetus who has single ventricle, what's the likelihood that this child will be alive six months after their Fontan operation? And to answer that, it's actually not statistically correct to do all the math of, of you know, you've got to do a longitudinal study. And we have the capacity to do that. And so I was sitting with one of our fellows, and this is how Great Fellows Projects get started, of course, you know, you, you sort of, um, listen in on things and then get, get bitten by a particular bug. Uh, 
And so uh, it was Michael Liu who took on this project. And we looked at 500 consecutive patients who had a prenatal diagnosis of single ventricle, all comers, knowing that mm, some are high risk, some are lower risks, various complications, but you have a single ventricle at 20 weeks. What is the likelihood that I can counsel you and tell you you're going to take your child home after the Fontan operation? Of our 500, 348 survived live birth with intention to treat, which is sort of interesting to us that there was a fair amount of uh, degradation. Some of this is termination of pregnancy um, uh, and such, and some is palliative care as well. But of the 348 uh, with intention to treat, 234 survived six months post-Fontan, coming out, interestingly, to a two-thirds number. So if you're intending to treat, if you're going to go forward with the pregnancy, at our center, two out of three of those babies will be three, four-year-old children that you'll be able to take home after the Fontana operation. I thought that was a very powerful study uh, and something that uh, for us was um, somewhat sobering, again, because we, we like to tend to think percentages are going to be higher than that, right? You know, our stage one NORD outcomes are 90% and all this sort of stuff, you know. Our center does a lot of this as well as, as every you know, major center does. But um, yes, but you have to look at the aggregates. That may be true, but, but for a parent, you need to know the answer to the question, am I going to take my child home you know, after, after you think you're done? And then the story begins from the Fontan circulatory perspective. So we are able to create survival today. And, and perhaps I'm, I'm belaboring this because I think it's something that we need to congratulate ourselves for. Um, when I was listening to the, uh, the cancer commercials at St. Jude's, <laughs> um, they say, oh my gosh, you know, one out of five children with cancer, with leukemia, do not survive. On the other hand, four out of five children with cancer today survive. That's incredible, right? You talk about, you know, where things were in the 1940s and 50s, where it's a death sentence. Most children today with childhood leukemia will survive. Guess what? Most fetuses diagnosed with congenital heart disease today with single ventricle will survive. I think that's an incredible statement. And, and as a medical community who cares for these individuals, I think we would be congratulated. We've got a lot more work to do, but that's a positive statement. We do have a pathway of survival for these individuals. Again, all comers, some better than others, but in general, the answer is, yeah, we can, we can make these patients survive. But can we give them a normal quality and duration of life? Perhaps is the next question to ask. When you look at all the survival curves, all major centers around the world, Mayo Clinic, Boston, our center, CHOP, uh, the Australian New Zealand uh, registry, which is one of the largest 1,700 patients in their registry, this pretty much is the composite uh, curve for uh, survival, for mortality. About 80, 85% survival out to 25 years, which again is, is pretty good, come to think of it. However, when you look at morbidity in this population, very few are going to be morbid free by the time they get to their teenage years, in some manner, in some way. You go back to the original Fontan paper uh, back in the early 1970s, and even Fontan himself said, quote, this procedure is not an anatomical correction, which would require the creation of a right ventricle, building another ventricle. People are working on that, people are thinking about that, but as we sit here today, that is not an option for our patients. But a procedure of physiological pulmonary blood flow restoration with suppression of right and left blood flow mixing. Fontan created this operation to treat the problem of cyanosis. Patients with single ventricle and tricuspid atresia in the 60s and 70s, some survived stumbling along into their young adult years. They would get blue, they'd get a shunt, they would get blue again, they get another shunt and then ultimately succumb to that. And what Fontan created was a procedure to obviate the need for recurrent shunt placement by building on this concept of cable pulmonary blood flow. It was never intended to be this sort of cure or a sustained state of solution that we currently seem to think that it is. And the other question to ask is what price do we pay for the suppression of this mixing and increased arterial saturation? Uh, some of the most astute things th that I've heard ha have come from patients and, and families and such. So uh, I think all of us who see these patients in our clinic and such, you know, education is key. Uh, 
So we try to explain to families, try to explain to kids, and I was explaining to, uh, this is now a number of years ago, to Ryan and his family, you only have one pump, the pump the blood doesn't flow. He goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, if there's no pump, how does the blood flow? All right, so that was kind of a tough question to, to answer because if you think about it, I'm not sure we know exactly why blood flows in a Fontan circulation and what the determinants are of pulmonary blood flow. William Harvey described the circulation in 1628. And according to him, he's supposed to have two pumps, right? Two ventricles. The veins travel back to the heart. The arteries travel away. Uh, but in our single ventricle patients, those rules are abrogated. That's not the case. And what are the determinants of blood flow in a Fontan circulation is sort of interesting. Um, probably don't have too much time to get into it here. I'll do a little bit more of this maybe later in the day. Uh, perhaps offer some insights into the various uh, factors that contribute to uh, determining blood flow. We think about diastolic function, we think about systolic function, the rhythm, your volume status, uh, the mechanics of the pathway through which the blood is flowing are all important features. Um, but it is interesting to think about this next time you see a Fontan patient, what's actually determining that blood flow. Let me also say that uh, what we now know, perhaps, is a very important determinant is your peripheral musculature. And I'm standing here right now and giving you a lecture. I have a right ventricle, but my right ventricle is being augmented by the fact that my lower extremity muscles are contracting and driving venous return into the right side of the heart. And uh, I'm breathing, expanding my thoracic cage, and those are things that are also drive blood when you don't have a pump, probably more so than when you do have a pump. What are the physiological consequences of this? Obligatorily, every patient's gonna have some degree of central venous hypertension and some degree of relatively low cardiac output due to an impaired ability to deliver a normal quality of blood volume across the pulmonary bed, impaired ventricular filling, an inability to adequately increase stroke volume during periods of increased demand, and variable levels of impaired chronotropy. So this is your physiological signature of how these individuals exist. How does that translate clinically? Well, we have our Fontan circulation. We have about 80% plus survival 25 years out. And in a progressive manner, this is what we see. And I can probably refer to this as, a, as the classic signature as well. Something that folks refer to as the Fontan circulatory syndrome where there is a physiological chronic state of increased central venous pressure, relatively low cardiac output, some cardiovascular fragility uh, related to ventricular performance and AV valve performance, uh, manifested as perhaps some exercise intolerance and arrhythmia, variable degrees of biological dysregulation, which we're just beginning to tap into right now and better understand, but what we do see from a clinical perspective are a series of end organ dysfunctions that involve the liver, the lymphatic system, growth and bone health, your coagulation system, the kidneys, neurodevelopmental deficits, and uh, a host of uh, perhaps uh, growing challenges, and sometimes uh, elements that take up more time in my cardiology visit than looking at the echo, uh, is their levels of anxiety, depression, and some of the mental health challenges that these, particularly adolescents, are faced with. Why are these pathologies present? Uh, a little bit of a structural model to, to think about here. Um, it's not all related just to the Fontan circulation, so one way to think about this is you're unfortunately stricken with a birth defect of the heart it's kind of naive to think that all the other organs are spared when that's the case. Uh, we do know that neurodevelopment, or, or I should say neurological uh, state, brain health and such, is somewhat different in the fetus and even in the newborn with single ventricle. Um, and perhaps, not terribly studied, but some, some folks are beginning to look at this, other organs like your liver um, and kidneys may be somewhat different as well. Uh, in a subtle way that may not manifest immediately, but in ways that might make those organs uh, fragile and less resilient when you layer on top of it the other aspect of what can contribute to a pathology, and that's the fact that to get 
patients to a stable state, they have to undergo these major operations and love different levels of cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, and so there are the rigors of the surgical reconstruction that contribute to some of these complications. And then you land in a place where, as we just mentioned, the physiology is abnormal in a sustained state. So imagine all of these accruing from fetal to adult life in a cumulative manner. Now you begin to understand why we see what we see in our 16, 20, 25 year old who may have a variety of challenges. And then all of this is open to uh, genetic influences, perhaps predispositions to some of these abnormalities or maybe some resilience to some of these stressors. All of these, I think, layering one on top of the other uh, leading to what we see clinically, but also what we see with tremendous variability. And, and here's perhaps one of the most fascinating things and amazing things that uh, uh, I continue to experience on a, a regular basis, and that is that I will know the history of a particular patient, perhaps even having been on ECMO or had some other challenges, and they're 16 years old, and they're doing great. They're at school and they're exercising. And then there are some other patients who would have predicted would have had a much more straightforward course. And they're suffering from protein losing enteropathy or succumbing to heart failure in some way. We don't understand the, why there is such tremendous variability. And when we look at the liver as well, we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, tremendous variability in the degree of fibrosis. And it's not clear that it's directly related to the severity of the hemodynamics. Uh, that even some of our patients who ha happen to have the most acceptable and reasonable hemodynamics seem to have more, uh, a greater magnitude of liver I issues or can manifest life-threatening protein-losing enteropathy. So what we have is the Fontana Circulatory Syndrome, systemic venous hypertension and low cardiac output, and a host of challenges and complications within this Fontana Circulatory Syndrome. So let me spend a couple of minutes sort of diving into uh, some of these different areas and briefly, uh, in a shallow way, describing uh, what, what exists. Uh, and I think you'll begin to see perhaps uh, some connections between these. So the lymphatic system, uh, which um, is just now perhaps beginning to have light uh, shined on it, uh, is still something we don't fully, fully understand. but. Um, what do your lymphatics do? They drain uh, waste water away from your tissues. Uh, and all of that uh, waste water and waste material drains ultimately into your venous system. Well, if you have elevated central venous pressure, you're going to increase the amount of lymph that's created in your tissue. And by virtue of where your lymph system is dumping, which is into your, your innominate vein and other uh, venous structures, you're also impeding drainage. So it's not surprising that we have the potential for lymphatic insufficiency in our patients with a Fontan. Now, if this were true in every single patient, then we would not be having this lecture here today at all, because nobody would survive a Fontan. But it only seems to occur in about 10% of patients who have severe lymphatic insufficiency to the extent of the lymphatic system not draining into the venous system and draining somewhere else, right? So your, your lymphatic system is supposed to drain into your central venous system. You do a Fontan, central venous pressure is up, the lymphatic system uh, under strain, but it remains competent. But in some cases, incompetence of that system occurs. Probably about five to 10% of cases. And that's the model that we currently employ for thinking about these uh, sad, unfortunate conditions here. Uh, here is a uh, picture of a young man who's actually almost 19 years old uh, with severe protein losing enteropathy, uh, body wasting, ascites. Um, and here's a picture from another patient um, of a uh, bronchial cast. Uh, what's the problem with these two conditions? In PLE and plastic bronchitis, they're, they're two sides of the same coin, which is they are the 5 to 10% of our Fontan patients in whom the body thinks it's being smart. <laughs> it is decompressing the lymphatic system to the outside world. And what are the outside systems that connect uh, within us? It's in our gut, to the in external environment, and in our airway. 
And if those lymphatics happen to, unfortunately, connect to the gut and they're under duress, you end up draining into the gut, losing protein in a chronic manner, and you end up with, with uh, chronic hyperproteinemia and all the, the consequences. If those uh, lymphatic pathways drain into the airway, you can leak variable degrees of lymph into your airway, protein accumulating and forming these casts, which can um, be asphyxiating, uh, if not uh, fully removed. Yoav Dori, who's a, a colleague at CHOP, uh, spent the last uh, seven, eight years now really focusing in on, on this problem. So I want to give him credit for this uh, lovely little animation that demonstrates uh, PLE. And what he has found is that it's, it's mostly the lymphatics within the liver that appear to connect to the duodenum. Uh, and even at reasonably uh, good Fontan hemodynamics, pressures of, say, 10 or 12 millimeters of mercury, which we would say is fairly good if you go on and you know, do a card cardiac catheterization, simply having that be two to three times the normal venous pressure, normal lymphatic pressure, in individuals in whom their lymphatic architecture are unique enough to have connections to the gut. And, and that's what we've learned, by the way. All of us have our own lymphatic architecture uh, that is somewhat different, but about 5 to 10 percent of the population do have lymphatics that connect from the liver to the gut to the, to the duodenum. And if that's under duress and under high pressure, your lymphatic system decompresses uh, into, the, uh, into the gut. This was proven uh, very elegantly uh, by a paper uh, that, we, that we did a number of years ago now, I think it was maybe six, five, six years ago, where um, uh, Yoav and Max Itkin, an interventional radiologist at Penn, were able to um, uh, cannulate the lymphatics in the liver, which is what you see here. And we had one of our GI docs uh, come in and do a simultaneous scoping. So while they were in the lymphatic, they injected some um, uh, methylene blue and were able to directly visualize uh, the drainage into the gut, like lymph pouring into the, into the gut. Uh, so this demonstrates the direct connection uh, and is the, uh, the etiology for protein losing atropathy. Part of this also involves inflammation. So lymphatic drainage into the gut in variable degrees can lead to inflammation. And so there's an inflammatory component to, to this condition as well, which interestingly does respond to some degree of anti-inflammatory therapy. What do we see in, in our non-PLE patients? Um, all of them seem to have a predilection towards some degree of lymphatic derangement uh, because the lymphatic system is, again, under duress. And here's some work we did, again, a couple of years ago looking at a cohort of 178 patients, 147 had no PLE, 31 with PLE, and looked at their absolute lymphocyte count and uh, IgG levels, uh, which uh, in the PLE patients were quite abnormal, but even in the non-PLE patients were slightly abnormal. Uh, and the greatest clinical manifestations in those patients related to uh, two-thirds having some form of atopy and about a quarter having really difficult challenges with warts and molluscum. So next time you see a, your five, six, seven-year-old Fontan patient in clinic, check their arms and such. And just here are some pictures of what, uh, of what this can look like. Again, clinically, OK, you know, you're alive. You have a single ventricle. This seems like a minor problem. But, but for kids who are going to school uh, and such who are otherwise functioning well, this can be a major, major problem um, and, uh, with secondary infections and such. So we've, uh, we've given our dermatologists plenty to work with here um, to try and, and solve some of these. Uh, when we look at lymphocyte count uh, over time in a relatively large cohort of patients, like many of the complications that we see, there appears to be progressive worsening as our patients get older. So what you see in this graph here are the percent of patients with an absolute lymphocyte count of less than 1,000 um, based on uh, their, their age. And as you get to being over 20, uh, nearly half the patients will have somewhat low ALCs. It does not manifest in ma major immunodeficiency, but it is interesting that, that um, these kids seem to have, when you look at their T cells and such, uh, you know, uh, ratio abnormalities. We do have an immunologist as part of our team who is studying this. Um, they do seem to have a higher 
a problem in managing EB virus infections. Uh, and there have been reports, interestingly, of, uh, of a number of patients who've had transformation uh, of EB, EBV to lymphoproliferative challenges, uh, particularly those who have PLE uh, in a chronic state. So there's some, some interesting connections there. Bone health. Not something you'd think uh, directly would be uh, uh, evident in our, in our patients, but um, it is something that we do see. If you dive in a little bit more deeply, here's a study I'm going to show you of over 200 patients looking at growth uh, in the Fontan circulation and um, the presence of sarcopenia, muscle weakness, uh, and deficits in, uh, in bone health, primarily uh, through blood laboratory assessments and through DEXA scanning. So in this, uh, this graph here, what you see are uh, bone mineral densities Z-scores for DEXA scans, which we do routinely, by the way, in, in all of our patients who come through our, our Fontan Clinic. Uh, in green are the non-PLE patients, um, and in red are about 25 PLE patients. So the, their mean height Z-score, okay, our kids with PLE are going to be short. That's, that's a given because they have chronic protein loss. But interestingly, the Z-score for the non-PLE patients was low as well. And when you looked at bone mineral density, significantly lower for the non-PLE patients as well as the PLE patients. So bone mineral densitometry assessments indicate bone weakness and demineralization. When you start to look at this from a laboratory perspective, I can make this statement. Having a Fontan circulation puts you at risk for secondary hyperparathyroidism. And the parathyroid hormone levels in the population of non-PLE patients, uh, over 150, nearly half had abnormal levels of parathyroid hormone. And those in the PLE, of course, 84, 84% had abnormal parathyroid hormone levels. We're all profoundly vitamin D deficient as a society, <laughs> in Western society, but our Fontan patients even more so in particular, uh, if they have low vitamin D, um, you're going to find parathyroid hormone levels that are sky high. So, for the pediatricians in the audience and for the patients who come through our Fontan clinics, it's something that's relatively remediable. Uh, checking the vitamin D levels, looking at their parathyroid hormone, and trying to optimize uh, calcium metabolism as best as one can to provide for normal growth. How does the kidney fare? Uh, in this condition. The kidney is a very vascular organ, right? So you'd imagine that you'd see renal dysfunction and such, but interestingly, it's quite a resilient organ. And we don't see too much kidney problem in childhood. It's more something that our adult congenital heart disease uh, colleagues are seeing, usually in the uh, young adults, where there can be uh, um, albuminuria, uh, a rise in serum creatinine, a rise in cystatin C levels which is something we often see, and abnormal vascular resistance indices. Uh, we looked at a relatively younger cohort uh, a few years back and uh, found that uh, only 10% of patients um, with a median age of about 13 had a GFR that was uh, abnormal. Uh, and it was uh, relatively easy to make the case that cystatin C is probably a much more valuable uh, measure in this particular population than your creatinine, knowing that um, there can be poor muscle mass in these particular patients as well. Okay, the, the liver. Uh, a lot of uh, chatter uh, in social media uh, for these patients uh, in relation to the liver. A lot of maybe uh, over-concern uh, because we're not seeing florid uh, liver failure uh, in our Fontan patients, fortunately. Uh, but we are seeing things that do require some surveillance and some attention. Uh, and it's not surprising that the liver would be affected because it's that first organ that sits right underneath the Fontan connection. And so the concept of a congestive hepatopathy is something that, uh, that exists. And um, you know, pick your imaging study. We're going to talk much more about liver later today. Um, there are a host of abnormalities that one can identify. What you see here is some focal nodular hyperplasia, often seen in the periphery of the liver, and this nutmeg reticular pattern, usually indicative of lymphatic congestion. Uh, when you look at the liver tissue in these individuals, and this is just some basic hemodynamics in a completely healthy and well 18-year-old patient with single vesicle heterotaxy, uh, 
who had very desirable uh, Fontaine hemodynamics with a pulmonary artery pressure of only 10, but yet you look at the blue here, blue here being um, the fibrotic uh, change, there's a significant amount of fibrosis uh, in this liver uh, biopsy specimen. And what's interesting, it's both central and portal fibrosis that's seen, not, uh, sort of a little different than the adult type uh, liver diseases. So it doesn't fit nicely into any of the scoring systems for the magnitude of fibrosis that currently exists. Uh, it was back in 2012 that, uh, that our group got together, um, and uh, one of the rare times we developed consensus. We don't have consensus on this today, but we did back then, you know, it, <laughs> interestingly, uh, was that we said we were going to bring all of our single ventricle patients back and, um, and do a cath, uh, an MRI, and a liver biopsy. Uh, why? Because we need to. We need to understand as they enter adolescence as to how they're faring and what they're up to uh, and such. And so a little biopsy, a bit invasive, yes. Uh, I could talk more about that you know, later today as to how we rationalize that. But we still currently do this. Uh, we do the cath and the MRI for all of our patients who are 10 years out. We have them come back for a comprehensive evaluation because it's important to know what their status is uh, and having a proactive versus a reactive approach is key. One of our pathologists um, and Henry Lin, I don't know if Henry's here in the audience this morning, but he may be listening and I think we're gonna chat later on when Henry was at, uh, at CHOP. Um, he helped us to uh, design this more um, overall quantitative assessment of total burden of fibrosis using a stain called Sirius Red. And he and Pierre Russo um, worked on developing this technique for our Fontan uh, patients who are getting liver biopsies where we could come up with a quantitative way to measure the entire amount of collagen deposition in a field of view. And then you give it a percentage, 17%, 31%, 41%, what have you. Now we found this to be valuable because then we could look at the magnitude of fibrosis and begin to correlate it with some clinical variables to see if something might, might be related. And it turns out, this is in an early study um, done by Dave Goldberg, uh, who was a fellow at the time, uh, now one of our attendings. Uh, we actually did not find anything that correlated except for age and time from Fontan. In a weak way, but still significant, somewhat of a scattergram here, but we've now recapitulated this with over close to 300 patients now, where if you look at hemodynamics within the typical range and a host of other clinical variables, single right, single left, extra cardiac, lateral tunnel, fenestrated, non-fenestrated, you, know, you name whatever variable you think might contribute. Simply having a Fontan itself and the amount of time in which you have a Fontan seems to be associated with the progressive increase in the magnitude of overall fibrosis. Cirrhosis in this particular population, to be distinguished, again, I'm a cardiologist, so I, I, um, I'm a stickler about the definition of cirrhosis. You can't do an ultrasound and say that looks like a cirrhotic liver, no. That cirrhosis means you have cellular damage. Fibrosis is different, and fibrosis is theoretically reversible. So there's a lot of confusion, I think, within my sphere of, uh, um, uh, of colleagues and even families that think, oh my gosh, there's fibrosis, the liver is done. That's not the case. Cirrhosis is about 5% in this particular population. This is a kind of a median age of about 13, 14. It's getting to the adults. It's about 20% may have cirrhosis. Most of them, they'll have fibrosis and the fibrosis is progressive. Coagulopathy is present in these individuals because we have all the elements of Virchow's triad, of vessel wall injury, stasis, and intrinsic hypercoagulability. And as we know, all of, uh, of these individuals need to have some degree of protection, uh, usually with aspirin, although there's a lot of good experience now uh, growing with the, uh, with the uh, NOACs or DOACs uh, and uh, less use of warfarin as time's going on. And then something also that, of course, is essential for the quality of life and development of these individuals, and that's brain. And this is probably a, a lecture in and of itself. Uh, but just to state it, we, we know that patients with single ventricle have neurologic uh, differences from the get-go. And what we're looking at here are neonatal uh, MRIs looking at the presence of periventricular leukomalacia. This is early work. Jane Newberger and others in Boston and around the world, people have been looking at this, uh, identifying differences in brain development uh, that exist even prenatally. 
we now know from, from fetal MRI studies that, um, uh, that there are differences in the topography uh, of the brain and its makeup. Fast forward now that we have two-thirds of these individuals surviving. What are the adolescents like? Very interesting in that we see uh, MRI abnormalities uh, and brain injury in the regions that control cognition, but also areas that control anxiety and depression. All of this leading to about 65% of young adults with single ventricle who will have some degree of behavioral uh, or psychiatric morbidity and ADHD. So this is a substantial burden uh, of disease that we need to address, and I think its recognition is key. So quickly, in the last couple of minutes, uh, finishing up, how, how do we address all these challenges uh, today? And how do, we, how do we begin to make a difference? We need to continue to better understand the uniqueness of these individuals. And uh, we don't have an immediate solution. The way to think about this is this is a chronic illness. And we need to take what we know, create effective models of care. We've applied this to our newborns interstage, and we've made a dramatic difference in survival of newborns with congenital heart disease. And I think in a similar way, we need to address what needs to be done after the Fontan operation for these individuals. So it's a matter of awareness, screening and surveillance, and a proactive strategy of care. This led us now, over, 20, over 10 years ago probably now, uh, to develop what we currently call our Fontan Forward Program. You heard earlier in my introduction, Forward stands for Fontan Rehabilitation, Wellness, and Resilience Development. I think we picked the word forward first and then came up with what each of the <laughs> letters should re represent. <laughs> we wanted it to be positive. You know, the initial name for our, our clinic was the Single Ventricle Survivorship Program. A little bit of a negative downer connotation to that, maybe, and we wanted to have something that was more positive because, in essence, that is the goal here. We uh, bring together a group of individuals who are dedicated to understanding the uniqueness of this particular population, and by cohorting these individuals into this clinic, we, in our clinic, we don't take over the care of your single vegetable patient. We are a consultative service, so all the close ties that have been built between good pediatric cardiologists and the families over years are not broken. I think that's so critically important. Um, we don't want to now take over the full care of the patient. Parents you know, trust those individuals who have shepherded them through this process. What we're offering is this consultative service one layer above that we can provide the expertise of where we've seen these patients. Don't get too excited if the AST and the ALT are that level don't freak out if you, know, you see X, Y, or Z. We're familiar with this. Let us follow it, that sort of thing. So the, uh, the clinic, uh, the core of the clinic is made up of a cardiologist, a hepatologist, an endocrinologist, and an immunologist uh, help, who's helped us with, uh, with our PLE care. And we've recently, in the last three years now, added an ec a dedicated exercise physiologist. We are very fortunate through donor funds to have a dedicated psychologist who's now part of the group, a nutritionist, and a growing, strong uh, effort on education, educational materials. Some of the animations I showed you are from some of those educational materials. We meet monthly. Uh, we see five, six patients uh, at a time. Uh, they all come to cardiology clinic, and all the specialists come to the cardiology clinic. And um, what we do uh, is still somewhat non-evidence-based. <laughs> Uh, I will say, but yet is something uh, that we offer that uh, helps us understand these patients and contributed to the uh, AHA statement that we, uh, that we put out a number of years back where there are a variety of proposed surveillance assessments that are age specific for each of the different organs. And uh, it is actually gratifying to see that I think many, many centers around the world now have adopted some element of this and are now offering it uh, to their patients. There is power in numbers. So this is actually from a couple of years back, but just once you start to collect this data, you get a better sense of what these populations do. And so here's, uh, we now have seen over 700 patients in our clinic in the last 10 years. Uh, even at <clears throat> a little bit over 300 patients, we were able just to look at what medications they're on. And this is a little bit old, but take a look at this. You know, 80, over 80% 80 were on aspirin. A little more than half were in ACE inhibitors, probably 
Half of those didn't even need to be on ACE inhibitors, but they were still on it. Um, some were on diuretics um, and a growing number on, uh, on psychiatric and behavioral medications. Now it's about 20% 20, 20 actually. Uh, lymphocyte count, platelet count, and GGT trajectories as patients come in through the clinic as well. It's given us opportunity to look not just at some of the individuals who have challenges, but some of those who, again, seem to be doing very well. And there's a growing number of those uh, patients who are the high performers. Um, in this particular cohort, uh, studied by Scott Weinrib, who was a medical student at the time, he's now uh, actually one of our graduating cardiology fellows, uh, he found that vitamin D sufficiency and the ALC count were positively associated with your peak VO2. And being obese or overweight was negatively associated, but ventricular morphology or uh, type of Fontan was not associated with your, your uh, oxygen consumption. Tremendous interest now in trying to understand what does impact uh, your wellness with a Fontan circulation. And I think we are beginning to appreciate that there may not be a magic bullet, that it's not a particular drug that's going to cure this. Uh, this is a uh, graph from um, uh, a colleague uh, uh, in uh, Australia who has been doing this work, uh, Rachel Cordina. And uh, she just put all of this up here, uh, different therapies and interventions that have been published over the years, and their stated evidence impact on change in peak oxygen uptake, right? So this is, for better or for worse, one of the measures we use for how well you're doing with the Fontan circulation. The higher your peak oxygen uptake, um, the better you are. Well, one randomized trial in Enalapril showed a decrease <laughs> in oxygen consumption, okay? But yet we continue to use Enalapril. The work that, that Dave Goldberg uh, and I and some others have been looking at, the fuel trial and such, minuscule uh, differences, um, but still some positive differences. And fuel 2 is starting up soon, and we can talk more about that later. Bocentin may be a little bit more of an impact, but look at the impact of an exercise program. A substantial, up to a 20% in a recent paper, increase in your peak VO2 simply by having our kids exercise and training them. This is dwarfs any medication that you could give to these. So exercise is the best medicine for a Fontan circulation today. Totally counter to what we used to think. And I used to say this myself, you know, take it easy, don't push yourself. You know, if you get tired, rest. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Right now, you've got to be out there more than our patients with, with two ventricles and exercising. And we need to come up with the, uh, the, the strategies for that. How are we going to continue to learn uh, about what we need to do for these patients? Um, it's through uh, national registries, such as the Fontan Outcomes Network. And just to quickly list what our, what our objectives are here, it's a learning network and a clinical registry, and building a community with patients. The goal is to achieve a number of different uh, QI efforts and to really create a life trajectory registry that can allow us to understand the variability in these patients. This started out as 12 founding centers. There are now uh, 31 centers across North America that are contributing data to, to this particular registry. Um, patients are being consented to enter. Um, there have been a variety of family-based activities. Uh, you can see some folks in here, Kiona Allen uh, from Chicago. Uh, they've been very much involved with some of the folks in, in Arizona. Uh, we launched in the beginning of 2023. We now have uh, close to 600. Uh, patients across the different centers that are enrolled, and our goal is to have 1,000 patients within a year and 10,000 over three years. A lot of data to collect. Uh, it's, it's not a, uh, a skinny data set by any means, but one that we think will be helpful in understanding the variability. So what can we conclude? A pathway for survival for those born with single ventricle today does exist, but it is full of challenges and hurdles. The Fontan circulatory syndrome is not just a cardiovascular phenomenon, but it's something that involves the entire human uh, and multiple organ systems. And as more and more individuals survive, so is the recognition and the need for further discovery and research to understand this variability in outcomes. And by doing that, we can best identify some of the modifiable variables that will improve quality uh, of life and duration uh, for these patients.
This graph is a listing of a PubMed uh, citations of the word Fontaine. And uh, I started in 92 because that's when I finished my fellowship. Uh, you know, I was the first year attending in 1992 and uh, counted it out to 2022. So 30 years uh, of knowledge uh, encompassed in, in here. A little disappointed to begin to see a drop in some of the, uh, uh, the publications, but it does reflect the, the, the growing body of knowledge that we have uh, and certainly something that needs to continue to increase if we're going to create a normal quality and dura duration of life for these individuals. So with that, I'll end, and thank you all very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much. That was really fantastic. I have the microphone down here, and um, we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah. A wonderful talk, uh, Jack. Um, quick question regarding exercise. Um, I think there's increasing evidence that it's beneficial in a variety of states. I wonder if you've seen any evidence to improve psychosocial scores in your, in your Fontan patients who are exercising regularly. That's a great question, and you know, um, naturally, you'd believe that would be the case. Um, um, and we are studying it. I know other centers are studying. It. Don't yet have the evidence to demonstrate that. Uh, I fully expect that that's going to be the case. There, there's no doubt uh, because there's no reason to think that it, it, it would be any different uh, in a Fontan patient than what you see in, in normal society. That exercise is. Uh, co-related, co-associated with an improvement in mental health and such. Um, to what degree and magnitude will particular types of exercise improve upon levels of anxiety uh, and such in this population is currently being studied. Uh, the only other thing I'd add to that also is that we, we, we've well characterized um, the, the challenge. We know what the levels of anxiety and depression are in this particular population. but we don't yet know what kind of exercise is best. And um, I suspect it will be age dependent also as to what we recommend. In the general sense that at some point, once you've had your Fontan operation, you've recovered, you probably start, should be put into some rehabilitation program. What exactly is that? We think lower extremity uh, strengthening and probably thoracic cage uh, and diaphragmatic excursion uh, amplification because those are the things that are gonna drive blood forward. So that's going to be an exercise focus that's going to be a little bit different than your 14 or 16 year old who's managing depression or anxiety where maybe, you know, uh, focusing more on aerobic or some other types of things. And whether everybody needs a trainer or whether you can do this remotely is also being studied right now as well through some, um, uh, some programs. So hope to, hope to have more information. Mike Silberbach. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, the title of your talk was about the single ventricle, but all you really talked about was the Fontan operation. And I'm wondering, you know, maybe that uh, inflection point uh, on your uh, citation curve is actually representing that maybe we're finally realizing that the Fontan is not the destination for the single ventricle. And I, I do wonder what you think about you know, some alternative ideas, other kinds of destinations, rather than to the Fontan uh, operation. Thank you. Yeah. Also, great, great, great question. Very, very fundamental question. Um, there are efforts underway. Uh, and I can list them here in a moment. But I think the key answer to your question is that I don't see anything clinically relevant for at least another decade, if not more. So in the next decade, we are going to continue to see a large number of uh, single ventricle Fontan patients. And they're going to be not just in their teenage years and 20s, they're now going to be in their 20s and 30s. And these particular challenges are not going to be going away for them. So currently, there are efforts underway to try and develop uh, mechanical assist devices. Uh, there's the Rodefeld device in Indiana. There's a group uh, in Europe that's working uh, on things. It is still very early. Uh, in, in the phase of design uh, and computational assessments, uh, they're not even at the animal uh, phase just yet. By the way, animal models of Fontan, very challenging as well, uh, and that's 
perhaps part of the, the issue here. You know, whenever we, uh, we present any of this sort of work to the adult research realm, they're like, okay, well, where's your animal model so we can you know, get to work on it? We can't recapitulate uh, all of the unique elements of the Fontan in, an, in a survivable animal model. Um, there's a group at Columbus that's, that's done a little bit of work with that in a sheep, but even that is, is not exactly you know, similar to what we see. So uh, you know, I think that the Rodefeld work will come to fruition at some point. Um, I don't see it on the immediate horizon. Uh, there's the field of regenerative medicine uh, and, and such that you know, a lot of excitement. Um, I'm going to say that's probably all there is at the moment that I could see is excitement maybe you know, um, hope and promise. But again, from a practical perspective, I don't see a solution beyond the Fontan for the next 10 years. Now, could we modify the Fontan? Should we try and avoid a Fontan? You know, the Boston group pushing that envelope as best as possible. Um, are two ventricular pumps in a Fontan system, could we rehabilitate the smaller ventricle to some degree to assist in some manner and obviate some of these complications? So that focus is there, but we're going to be dealing with the Fontan for at least the next decade, if not longer. Jack, that was uh, terrific. Uh, thank you very much for your inspiration and uh, just uh, an, a super excellent talk. Uh, we learned from uh, past Kasdan uh, days and what we did for our noon event and also for the afternoon lecture. We've allowed a little bit extra time for discussions, so I know there's lots more questions and uh, we'll be able to um, you know, go into more detail at that time. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for taking the trip out to uh, Oregon uh, this week. Uh, when you come back in nine years, uh, great, please bring it back uh, so we can engrave another date uh, into the... Great. Thanks yes. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Can we take a picture?